I woke up after that. After the first few hours of that day in Bill's life. I know this is weird. I know his city, uh, his life. They seem so different from this world. But I need to know why me. And if there's anything I should do. Please. I know what information I've laid down is little. Uh, he has seemingly no relation to me. And his story is seemingly separate as well. But I just have a feeling that is not the case. Is there anyone that could help me with what is happening? Maybe in my past reportings, there's something. Is there anywhere in the world I should go? Uh, what should I do? What should I ask when I get there? I'll give an update tomorrow. In yesterday's post, I got some great feedback after a possible connection between the earlier reporting I've done and what's been going on in my dreams. The suggestion was to speak to Dr. Alice Hahn of the State University of New York at Buffalo and to contact a student that worked on a project with her, Simon. The Connection, a digital world project they were working on together. While I'm still a bit jet-lagged from my recent trip to China, I've finished the eight-and-a-half-hour drive from New York City to Buffalo, and I'm here again and ready to speak to Dr. Hahn. Unfortunately, it seems she does not want to speak to me. Since being interviewed for my report on Simon's unusual protest earlier this year, she told me that her superiors are furious with her. She told me that what she said in the report could even get her reassigned from the current Digital World project she's been working on. That seems quite incredible to me, honestly. She has been the lead researcher for several years on this project, and to suspend her over a little read report is odd. I believe that maybe a larger power than Buffalo University has might be at work. But I just don't know for sure. While answers from Dr. Han seem elusive right now, I've emailed the students that worked on the project with her. Uh, he currently resides in Sweden, and asked if someone might have power over her research, and who they might be. He actually just sent me his response this afternoon, but it's something I'll need help with and have saved for the end of this post. In the meantime, I wanted to continue with Bill Neven and his first day helping at the Northeastern Police Station in the digital city of Welvin. Having just learned of the first person to ever die of his digital utopian city, he now has to navigate the complicated issue of knowing a secret that could alarm and frighten the whole city. Picking up after immediately speaking to Chancellor David Strom, this is the second dream I had. I walk out of the police station and see Peter standing by the open trunk, where Matterson is now healed enough to be a single lump of flesh. I nearly reach the trunk when Peter asks, What the hell was that about? Before I can answer, Chancellor Strom walks out of the station, catching Peter's eye and leaving him no doubt as shocked as I was when I first saw Strom in person. Peter, keeping his eyes on Chancellor Strom, says, Hell, you're a lot more important than I thought, Mr. Advisor. I'm anxious, still processing about what Strom had said and what needs to be done. There are two killers on the loose. One, this major criminal I came to the station to help track. I know he's dangerous, but he cannot complete the act. He cannot actually kill. He must be a lower priority now. The other, someone who has found a way to kill, but uh, no, more fundamental. Someone has found a way to disrupt society. The single truth we all believe to be true has been changed. That could be more dangerous than any single death if people found out. Hey! Peter snaps his fingers. It knocks me out of my headspace and I focus. Mind telling me what Chancellor Strom was doing here? I'm caught off guard. It's the most obvious question and I didn't prepare for it. Do you know my last name? I say. A stall question, but perhaps legitimate. And now? Peter says. I guess I don't. I suppose you don't know mine either. Baker. Peter Baker. And he reaches out his hand. Neven, I respond, extending my hand and shaking his. Bill Neven. 
It's good that we get to know each other, Peter. Now, this is serious business with your major criminal. Chancellor Strom was here just now to say it is of utmost importance that we find out who is doing these tortures. These awful things. It was partially the truth. I couldn't tell Peter someone had died. At least, not yet. I couldn't risk the news spreading, but I figured I would need Peter's help to find the real threat. At a minimum, I needed his car, and better, the weapons that come with every police station. The look on Peter's face says he doesn't believe the lie. Chancellor Strong believes finding this torture is the most pressing thing, Peter asks rhetorically. Okay, and he believes you are actually the best person to help this station solve this urgent matter. Yes, I responded with less than complete certainty. We both, together, we are the best suited to solve this. You have 120 years of experience at this station, and I've got about a decade reading about how this job used to be done in the old world. Together, Chancellor Strom thinks we're the best chance at finding this rare criminal. Get in the car, Peter says, and he quickly closes the trunk with Matterson's body and heads to the driver's seat. I follow, and as I get in, I see a taut face on Peter. As the car starts moving, I ask him several times where we're going, but he doesn't give an answer. A few minutes on the road, I try again. Do you want to explain where we're going? You go to that bakery coffee spot this morning? Peter says. What? Did you go? It's across from the station. Popular spa, thrown by two volunteers, uh, the couple, two women. Uh, yeah, I say, as I notice a passing sign that we're moving towards the city center. Uh, yeah, I had a cup of coffee there this morning. What do you think they get, huh? The couple. What do you think they receive from the council for volunteering there? Uh, I don't know, I say. An apartment? A nice one? Maybe a car? Maybe they get some time built up where they don't have to volunteer or study for a few years. Some favors like that. Uh, sure. I guess. That seems fair. Fair, Peter says, raising his voice slightly. You know what I get for my volunteering? For my volunteering I've been doing for 120 years? Uh, no. I get this car. Peter waves one hand around the interior. And I get this weapon. He raises his light outer jackets to show his Alero rod, the standard weapon assigned to police volunteers. Now, that's not particularly fair, he continues. You saw this morning with Madison what we had to deal with. You think that just happens every once in a while? No, that happens every day. That is half of what police do. People like you. You don't care because you don't know about it. Nobody seems to care about the daily jumpers. But me? People like me that volunteer at police stations? Well, hell. People jump off buildings all the time to absolutely no one's horror in exchange for a car. Now that seems like a pretty rotten deal. I didn't know. I stated slowly. I didn't know people jumped like that. I... Uh, we... Uh, people don't talk about it. But I don't know why. Peter relaxes the tension in his shoulders that he had built up during his rant. He lets off the wheel as the car slows. People don't talk about the jumpers, he says calmly. Because people don't like talk about those so different that they can't see any of themselves in an action like jumping off a roof. They can't empathize with that type of thing. The car is stopping now. I look at the buildings and see we're near the very center of the city. No. People don't talk about jumpers because there's nothing you can do about them. Peter continues. But you know what else police volunteers do, Bill? What? They had monsters, Peter says, getting out of the car. I stay confused by his last words. 
Through the window, I see him go around the corner of one of the massive city center buildings, monumentous to Welvin that grow taller as the city expands ever outwards. I get out and walk around the corner. There, Peter stands holding open a door well hidden from the street. Come on, let's see the monsters, says Peter. Who are they? I ask looking through the graded floor that reaches into a pit no fewer than forty meters deep. At the bottom of the pit, dozens, maybe hundreds of men and some women moaning, crying, and screaming. The lighting is poor, just a few hand lamps litter the makeshift hole, and maybe just two sit at the bottom of the pit itself. Do you feel bad for him? Peter asks. I look down the pit again, trying to make out more detail. I see flashes of flesh when the hand lamps are angled right. It looks like emaciated bodies, bare flesh for everyone in the pit. A small shock comes over me, as I believe I see one man eating the flesh off another. What could they possibly have done? That major criminal you're supposed to help us find? They're not so unique. Pretty common, actually. See, police stations have been dealing with this type of thing for decades, uh, centuries. Uh, you mean... Yeah, Peter interrupts. In that pit is every torture, every dismember, every head basher, and pregnancy stabber our stations ever caught. Four hundred years worth of one station's crimes right there in that pit. Four hundred years, I say. You've kept people in here for four hundred years. You know how much room a police station has? Twenty cells. Well, there's more than twenty criminals that our station had to deal with. Dangerous, bad people. And this is it. He points out to the pits and follows a path around the makeshift room at the bottom of this massive building. This is the solution we came up with. This is how we deal with these criminals, these monsters. Because those designers you study didn't plan on them. They didn't plan on what to do with them. Forget about the roads. This, this is a bad design. W one station. Uh, you mean every station has a pit like this? I know a few more pits, Peter responds. But for every station, I don't know. I mean, every station must have this problem. I don't know what solution they come up with for it, though. How can I not know about this? How can people not know about this? Because the counselor says not to talk about it. That's why. Because this is a utopia, right? Live forever, do what you want. All you gotta do is volunteer. So this pit raises some questions in your mind. I nod. Yeah? Well, it raises one in mine. Why the hell did Strom show up at our station to deal with the common problem he's known about for hundreds of years? Him and the council didn't give a second thought about all these other criminals. Certainly didn't care about how we caught them. What the hell's so special about you? I'll give you that maybe you were originally sent here to help chase down one of these guys we'd thrown in a pit. But that doesn't explain why Strom would be so personally involved. He's aware as much as the rest of the council of these pits. So what is so special about who we're chasing now? I pause. You're right. Uh, Chancellor Strom didn't want to talk about the criminal you're chasing. I look down at the pit and the flashes of emaciated faces in the dim light. A scream from below echoes in the room. We can talk about it, but uh, please, not here. I didn't fear Peter Baker. I didn't think he would drop me in the pit. I just wanted to get out of that room. Peter and I head towards the car, rounding the corner of the massive building. He must see it before me because he starts running. A split second, I speed up too. 
Peter stands in the middle of the wide local road. The few cars traveling on either side of him stop. All eyes are on his hands as he reaches for his waist and pulls out his Aliro rod. I've only ever seen one on video. Across the streets and by Peter's black car is a lump of a man. His flesh and bone and barely a face. His limbs don't look like they can fully extend as the skin joins in unnatural ways. I see now it's Smatterson, deformed but slowly beginning to resemble a man. He has his left arm wrapped around someone, a woman screaming. In his right hand, he holds another Aliro rot, no doubt taken from Peter's car. Kill him. A bass gurgle of a voice is heard from Matterson. Kill him right now. Peter, he reaches for his pocket and takes out his key with his left hand, holding his Aliro in his right. Let her go, and I'll throw you the keys. Matterson lets out a gurgled scream, and I see the woman bite his arm. In his other hand, his Aliro's crown expands. The seven sharp points on the top of the rod that sits perpendicular to the shaft. He stretches his arm back and slaps the rod down. The sharp edges of the crown cut into the woman's stomach, and she begins to bleed. Matterson tears the Aliro out, and the sharp edges are left in the woman's stomach. The woman falls to the floor as Matterson reaches out his hands. The kill. He screams, and the bass gurgled tone echoing from the deformed flesh. Peter stalls for a moment as Matterson pushes the side of the Alira. The sharp edges pushed into the woman's stomach on the ground responded, and an electric shock jolts her, and she forces a scream. He pushes the button of the Alira several more times, and the woman continues to be shocked. A few clicks, and the screaming stops. Peter approaches Matterson now, just as Matterson is trying to grab the woman off the ground. I've tried that before, Peter says, walking faster towards Matterson. There's a trick to it. Close now, Peter raises his Aliro and slams it into Matterson, still struggling to pick up the woman and rapidly tapping the shock button on his rod. The key, Peter starts as he tears his Aliro out of Matterson leaving behind the sharp crown edges. The key is you can't shock more than every 30 seconds. He pushes the Aliro, and the detached fragments burn and shock Matterson, flailing, partially smoking his flesh. I run across the street to see Peter trying to help the struck woman to her feet. It'll be all right, I hear him saying to her. Fragments come out easy. If the rod holder isn't pushing that button, they won't hurt you. His comments might be reassuring to anyone stuck with an Aliro before, but clearly the woman was still in dire pain. You gonna help me? Peter says, staring at me. I shift the weight of the woman onto my shoulder and help her to the side of the road. She is still moaning, but Peter is insisting we leave her. Looking at the woman's bloodied stomach, I hear Peter struggling and see him with Matterson's body. I reluctantly leave the woman. I have never seen an Aliro injury before, and didn't realize the chemical and electric damage it did to the skin, to the flesh, once its edges had jammed into the body. I get to my feet and help Peter support Matterson, and quickly realize we're dragging him back to the side door, to the pit. Instead, Peter gets out from Matterson's weights and leaves me holding the deformed flesh. He lifts the grating to the pit and says, Come on, dump him in. I look at Peter, frozen. What? No. He's too dangerous to leave in the car. He ain't just a psychotic danger to himself. You saw what he did to that woman. How do we get him out of there later? We don't. Peter yells back. I shake my head, and supporting Madison's weights, I begin moving him back outside. Peter begins to recover the pits as I move back to the car. By the time Peter is caught up, I've dragged Matterson back to the trunk, and I'm rolling him in. At the last second, Peter gives me a hand, and closes the trunk shut. 
Without a word, we both enter the car. You'd condemn a man for eternity because... I started. Because he's dangerous, Peter interrupts. We picked him up for avoiding volunteering and education, and now you want to throw him in a pit? We met him because of his avoidance. I want to throw him in a pit because he's clearly dangerous, not just to himself, but to other people too. Out the window of the stopped car, I can still see the woman on the side of the road recovering. I can't argue, and I think Peter realizes this. Before he has the car moving, Peter turns to me and says, Two things. One, if we're going to have that psycho in the car, lock the door when you leave, because the trunk stays unlocked if the doors are, too. And two, in addition to that pit, a psychotic like Madison is the type of situation the council already knows about and accepts as normal. So, now, you think you can tell me what new fresh hell's happening that Counselor Strom needs to get involved? I'll tell you, I say, muted, when we get there. I start giving instructions to head towards the eastern edge of the city. Forty minutes in relative silence. The only noise in the fast-moving car is Madison banging on the trunk. A muffled scream by Madison could be heard. He is clamoring to get back to his apartment. But neither Peter or myself can be bothered to give it much focus, or too absorbed in our own thoughts. For Peter, he must be thinking about what I'm hiding, what Strom could be too. He knows how many horrible things his station has sealed in a deep, dark pit, and with full knowledge of the council. He could only imagine what could be so horrible that it's now worth hiding from his station. For me, I'm just running through the pits and the criminals. I imagine the long work it must have taken to hollow out the pits and the room. I wonder where the stations source the materials for the grating, or how they could have gotten so many hand lamps. I think about the families of the people in the pits, if they ever wonder where they are or if people are searching for them. Most of all, I think about what Peter said. The council telling police stations not to tell the public how criminals are dealt with. How many other problems are solved this way, I wonder. We arrive at the eastern edge of Welvin, where new buildings, bakeries, stations, and schools are just beginning to take shape. Over time, the buildings would grow larger as the population increases. But for now... The highest building in this area is just five stories. Everything new in the last few months. The car stops where I direct Peter, and we both get out of the car at the same time. Peter heads to the trunk and pops it open. In an instant, he takes out his alero and jams it into Madison's body before quickly closing the trunk. Those fragments will stay in you for a while, Peter says his face close to the trunk. If I come back and the car's making a noise, I'm gonna push this button. He pushes the button on the side of the Aliro, and Madison's scream is heard from the trunk. As I start walking, I turn towards Peter and ask, I know we tried to escape by taking that woman, but isn't what you're doing still cruel? His main offense is just trying to get out of mandatory volunteering and education. Peter stops walking and waits for me to stop. I already didn't throw him in the pit. You want me to feel bad for that piece of dirt too? No, I just... Uh, never mind. What? Peter says, standing firm halfway between Shrine's building entrance and the car. What's your problem? I turn back a few steps and meet Peter's gaze. Those people... Who decides who goes in the pit? Our police station does, and the volunteers at that station. And council knows who they throw away. Not specifically. Peter! I yell, frustrated. But don't you think a bottomless pit from whence you never return is a bit of an overreaction to your station's problem? Overreaction? 
I'm just saying. Uh, look, I'm sure it makes some sense to throw some people in there, but Matterson? I mean, if you're willing to throw him in, I wonder who else is in there. There's a pause between us before I continue. Peter, what I'm going to show you is a much bigger problem than jumpers. It's a much bigger problem than your major criminals that you've been keeping in a pit. I don't know who caused the problem you're about to see, and I don't know how to solve it either. I just... I just want us to be on the same page, and so that we don't overreact. Bill, you're still afraid to tell me what Strom had to talk to you about. You sure a pit out of the view of the public wouldn't solve your problem? I think for a moment. If I had the person in front of me who figured out how to kill, a pit is probably the only sensible place for them to go. I just want to make sure, whatever we do, we do it with clear minds, I say. I was thinking clearly when I dragged Madison in that room. I pause. Just don't overreact. Peter and I walk into the new apartment building together. Peter makes for the elevator, but I tell him no. That we're just going to the second floor, and I head towards the stairs. Must be a pretty young person we're seeing, Peter says. Edge of Welvin, lowest floor. Who is it? A founder, I say. Uh, my mentor. I know they usually get center city, the tallest buildings, but this mentor would like to stay on the edge of the city, the lowest floor. I used to say it gave him perspective. It felt good to see progress. With Peter at my side, I knocked on Zachary's door. For a moment, I think there might not be a person, uh, conscious, alive, inside to answer, but soon the door opens slightly. I see a pair of tender brown eyes that I hadn't gazed upon in a long time and see again that below them are still deep sags of black and brown skin. Who is this? She says, before she recognizes me, and opens the door fully. What the hell, Bill? They told me you'd be here hours ago. She leaves the door open as she turns around and walks back into Shine's apartment. My ex, I say, meeting Peter's eyes, and I follow Kate with Peter a few feet behind me. Inside the small apartment, the man on the floor takes attention. Zachary Shine, 400-year-old teacher, artist, founder, former council member, uh, once even the chancellor. 400 years, gone. He lies on his back, his body completely still. I get on my knees and start inspecting the body. It's cold. I feel no pulse. Strom had said he recently passed, that they had measured his brain activity to confirm he was dead, but I saw no machine or people in the apartment other than Kate. Peter is watching over me as I inspect the body. He hasn't asked a question yet, but I imagine he's beginning to realize. Even if he doesn't understand what dead means, he'll understand the practical reality of what a lifeless body is and how this world has never seen one. I leave Peter gawking at Shine, desperately trying to figure out what had happened, and head towards the kitchen where I'd seen Kate quietly go once we walked into the apartment. By the sink, she was up to her usual self, scratching the rock tile of the countertop, breaking little pieces and sliding them into the several dozen clear plastic bags she had started carrying with her a decade ago. Kate had aged out to thirty about twice as long ago, but somehow she looked older now. The years of self-abuse, her skin is blotchy, dark where it shouldn't be. What are you doing? I say. She doesn't even bother meeting my gaze. Instead, looking down at the kitchen tile and continuing to peel away. You know what these are good for, she says flatly and uncaring. They're good for a kitchen counter. You know what I mean. You mean they're a good base ingredient to make a glitch. 
That's right, she says, a long acknowledgement like she's glad I could mutter it. Why are you here? Who found you? She looks up from the counter. Told me to wait for my moron ex-husband. She walks towards me, hand still full of tile. Said council would give me a new apartment if I waited here for you. Christ, Kate, do you even know why you're here? Because of you, she says softly, as she tries to walk past me and out of the kitchen. I grabbed her wrist, the hand still holding the kitchen tiles. Let go of me, she says as she tries to flail her hand. For God's sake, would you listen to me? Peter walks into the kitchen as Kate and I are reenacting a scene we'd relived many times over. Our hands lower. We appear to stop fighting and pretend everything is fine. Is anyone going to explain what the hell is going on with that man out there? Peter says. Still holding Kate's wrist, I say. He's dead. The muscles in her wrist go limp, and I let go of Kate's wrist. She looks at me, and so does Peter. What the hell does that mean? Says Kate. I leave Kate where she stands in the kitchen, and walk past Peter. In the living room, I stand above Zachary Shine. Peter and Kate meet me on either side. Tell no one, but what we all think about living forever, that might not be quite right, I say. The three of us look at Zachary Shine's lifeless corpse in silence. A moment later, Kate breaks it. She laughs, lights at first, but soon it builds, and her face is wide, and eyes tearing. <laughs>